Welcome, friends, to another Melted Wax podcast episode. And I have an old friend, an old friend who has come back from hiatus of not that long, but in the hobby world, uh, two weeks is, can be like four years. Um, so many things happen in our hobby space. But I've got Brent Ware from uh, Deep Value Investor, and you, hopefully we'll talk about some of your new uh, adventure, uh, new uh, d endeavors and things you're doing uh, recently. But thanks for joining and coming back and having another chat with me about the hobby. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks for having me back on, man. It's good to see your face. Yeah, no, absolutely. Likewise. Likewise, and it is good to have, see your face. So, hey, why, why, we'll just kick it off. Let's just kick it off. Uh, uh, we, let's just talk about why. What 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 was the impetus behind uh, taking a, a quick little reprieve from social media? Is there something yeah. that? Yeah, go ahead. Let's let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, I just felt like I needed a little bit of a, a dopamine cleanse. You know, I needed to get off of social media for a few weeks and just kind of reset and and focus on myself a little bit more and i think that's going to be a theme for me in 2024 is you know continuing this as a hobby and continuing to have a lot of genuine interest in sports cards but um also knowing when to take some breaks and knowing when to like take the foot off the gas a little bit because it my mind has a way of being you know high capacity all the time always thinking always strategizing and if i just focus it on cards it can all be focused on cards. And so it wasn't just about cards. You know, I took a break off of Twitter too, because I was just finding it, you know, just firing me up all the time. And it was these kind of like dopamine hits. And so taking a few weeks off felt good to kind of refresh and recharge a little bit and, and look at how I'm going to do things a little bit differently. Very cool. Very cool. I think it's always important to do stuff like that, sort of like a sabbatical, you know, a short yeah. amount of time. But I mean, two weeks is a long time. I think it's it's interesting when you think about two weeks in general, it doesn't sound like it's that long. It's not that long, really. But when you think about two weeks away from social media, we're also just completely attentive and glued to our phones, whether we like it or not. We take little breaks. We try to manage it the best we can. But we were just so sucked into it. It's two weeks is a long time to not be present online. Yeah. Yeah, it felt like a long time. I'd still listen to podcasts and I'd still check in, you know, um, but it, it definitely did feel like a long time. And I think that's a little eye opening also that a few weeks off of social media can feel like a long time. And getting back onto it, my first my first reaction was, you know, kind of interesting to see the kind of world that's created within sports cards. You know, these dynamics, these hierarchies, um, you know, making cards so cool even you know like it was interesting to kind of take a step back and then get back on and be like these guys these are sports cards like so it kind of gave me a little bit of you know um you know reality yeah perspective a little bit you know to stop yeah. and be like these are just cards like yeah, at just the end of the day yeah so pieces of cardboard some signed some not a little bit of gloss to them refracting technology some patches yeah. that are cut off of a jersey sometimes just a piece of the jersey where they tuck it in who yeah. knows, right? And that's yeah. that's that's what it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's interesting stuff. Um, all right. Well, let's it's it's great to have you back. I'm glad you're back. And since you're back, we always want to hear what you have to say. I always enjoy our conversations because uh you don't hold back, and it's it's good to hear that. You know, I do have some folks on where we talk about collecting and it's a very different cast of characters that I that I, I get to have on and I enjoy having on. But when you and I mm -hmm. chat, it's usually it's always a very popular episode. And I think it's because you speak your mind. You don't hold back and you say some things that sometimes people go, what? What did he just say? It's just good. I think it's good. It's challenges people's thought process on different markets of cards, types of cards, grading, the whole thing. So in your opinion, we're what, two, three weeks into 2024. I mean, not much has happened. Some Tom Brady cards are selling with Photoshopped images of Tom Brady for lots of money. Um, what does the hobby look like in 2024, in your opinion? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a continuation of what we saw second half of 2023. Um, what I feel from other people that I talk to, other collectors that have been heavily involved in collecting the last few years, is a little bit of like what I just said, taking the foot off the gas a little bit, like looking at other aspects of their life that they could be improving on. Um, I talked to somebody that was messaging me and you know, I'm not going to name names, of course, but, you know, he was discussing taking a loan out from his girlfriend to pay off credit cards while he had a stack of sports cards, you know, that were worth all this money. And so I had to spend some time with him and, and talk to him about those cards need to go first 
before you start taking loans from girlfriends to pay off debt that you bought the cards with. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of people are kind of feeling a little bit of a reality check, you know, like what other areas of my life are suffering because I've been focused too much on spending every dime I have in sports cards. That might be, you know, I haven't been investing my 401k. That might be, you know, I didn't take that trip that I would take, take a trip because I was spending all my money on sports cards. So I think there's, it's, it's just a transition of, yes, this can be investing and yes, this can be a hobby, but it doesn't have to be all consuming in all aspects of your life. And I feel like 2024 for me, and I think for a lot of people, we're going to witness a little bit of a transition to this being a hobby. And yes, they can be investments, but it doesn't have to be all consuming. And I, I think that's what we're seeing. I think there needs to be more buyers of cards that are actually wanting the, the cards to own then there are buyers of cards that want to buy the cards just to sell. And I think that's what we'll see a continuation of. That's a really good point. I think, you know, being mindful of, of your financial stability and situation, especially if you have family, young family. Um, of course, yeah. I, you know, as a banker, I'm always going to tell you, pay yourself first, make sure you're maxing out all the different retirement opportunities. They say between 15 and 20% of your, of your annual income is what you should be. That's pre-tax is what you should be putting away. So that kind of stuff needs to be happening before before you, you venture into uh, purchasing cards and stuff like that. I mean, I'm, and when you talk about purchasing cards, we're talking about making you know significant purchases. And that significant yeah. purchase amount can be different for everybody. So that just you have to gauge that properly for you right. and your life. So no, that's a great point, Brent. I, I, I think that we, and I've, I've talked about that too. Um, and I've actually had some conversations with some notable people. I, again, won't use names for the sources because they didn't want to yep. be shared. But they said there's a lot of folks that leveraged to the hilt to buy cards. A yeah. lot of people there's have sneaky ways that it plays out. It, there's like sneaky ways, right? So maintaining carrying debt while you have sports cards that have value. You know, like I said, not taking that trip, not investing in your 401k. Like there's sneaky ways that people can, you know, hide the debt of sports cards. I also think... 2024 will be a continuation of the Pareto distribution like we talked about in the past where, you know, most cards are on their way to the dollar bin box. And that's just the reality of most sports cards. I was just looking at a card today. Someone was asking me, it was a, a Michael Harris first Bowman auto and he has a red and, you know, I was looking at a recent orange sale and it was like 2,500 bucks. I was a 10 or $15,000 card not long ago. And what's scary is now it's 2,500 and I see no reason why it won't be a hundred dollars in five or 10 years. Like it, that's just the reality of most cards, right? So um, I think we'll see a continuation of that. We'll see a continuation of people recognizing most cards as far as an investment are not collectible for that. So um, that I think we'll see a continuation of that for 2024. So I was going to, I was joking with you when I, when I asked about you coming on, I'm like, let's do a Pareto victory lab. Because I, I do feel like the Pareto thought process has aged well into yeah. the latter half of la of 23 and the first half of 24 or the first at least few weeks of 24 we're seeing a lot of cards sell they're selling for much much less there was a, a sale last night at pwcc premiere of a ken griffey jr car you know i know the junior market it's an it's a game jersey card with the actual jersey it's hand number to 24 autographs and a funky spot could have been placed differently but either way there's not very many of them it's a high grade nine there's no nines in psa it's a bgs nine and it sold for about 20k and mm -hmm. at one point, a couple of years ago, that was a sixty-six thousand dollar card. So, mm -hmm. you know, even the cards that are important, that are that are sought after in the local in the community, are still settling, and they're still settling down. And yeah. there might still be a bottom for some of that. So that's something to always keep keep in the front of your mind when you're when you're looking at cards like that. Even with yeah. the Pareto principle in play, right? Right, right. Yeah, because you have to ask yourself. So Ken Griffey Jr. is of course in the Pareto principle. But then you have to ask yourself that specific card, is that card important and significant to Ken Griffey Jr.? And so that's right. That's always a question. And that's and it, it is. I think you, when I've been talking to some collectors and it's funny because that some people are, I mean, you know, people that love to keep cards that want to keep the cards, they want to own them. They want to hold them. The rare ones, the tough ones. They're going, you know, I, I think I have three. Yeah, I used yeah. to have like 30 or 40 or 50 or whatever the number is. Yeah. Now I, I think when you know push comes to shove these are the three that matter the most these are the three i don't think i can replace anytime i want not only just anytime i want but i may never be able to i sold a card earlier and i was questioning that I, I didn't think it was that big of a deal until i sold it and realized wow i'll never get that back there's two of them i won't get it back because 
there's a very high likelihood I won't get it back. Not waiting a couple years, but maybe never. So those are the type of cards you probably go, eh, I'm going to really try to hang. I'm going to work to hang on to these. But there's that's like 0.002%. Yeah. Just Speaking like, of King Griffey, I, I think what's been interesting is there's been so much talk around, you know, more rare and more special, more scarce cards. But if you notice his 89 upper deck PSA 10 is held strong. Right. There's there's a lot of cards where I almost feel like the pendulum has swung so far away from, oh, there's too high of a pop. Nobody wants this card. I'm seeing cards like that, like say an 81 Montana and a PSA yeah. nine. There's two or three thousand of those, but I'm seeing them just they're not going down anymore. So I'm seeing, you know, big air pockets and where all those cards where everyone was consolidating into, you know, those special rare cards where maybe that twenty thousand dollar Griffey should never have been sixty thousand. But right. now I'm seeing, you know, the PSA 10, 89 upper deck holding at 1800 to 2000 and it's not going down anymore. So I find that pretty interesting too in the market. Yeah. And I think that that's sometimes speak like the Montana, the Griffey, you think about some of these big iconic cards, even the mm -hmm. pop is high. You can't afford a nine or 10, like in the Montana case, that's a pretty big card. The nine is still attainable for a lot of folks. The 10 yeah. is actually still attainable for a lot of folks that are spending some of this money they're spending on some of these bigger cards. Right. for a griffey 89 upper deck and you're right there's so many of them but it's like when i first got into the hobby i, I wanted to own that car's first card i bought i needed yeah. to, it was a bgs9 it was whatever but i wanted to own it because as a kid that's the card right so and as you learn you grow maybe that you can, maybe it's swinging back the other way yeah maybe there's more people making affordable choices they're not trying to go get that card they don't have the money for and they can't justify it and it doesn't matter because sometimes you get that card and you flash it you show everybody and that's everybody's like oh it's really great wow it's amazing then some people go, I don't know how the heck you can afford that. And you start going, well, how did, how, how will I even able to afford that card? <laughs> so that's like, yeah. and it's like the shine wears off. You're like, well, now you're just sitting with this card. It's really cool. But what else could you do with that money? Right. So yeah, all those conversations, mm -hmm. I think uh, collectors and, and investors or whatever, everybody's having them. And just have you thinking if, it, if that card didn't go down in 2023, well, when's it going to go down it? You know, the investor in me is like, should I go buy 20 of these 89 PSA 10s? Because if they didn't go down in 2023, when are they going to go down? It goes against everything that we all talk about, like the pops yeah. high, you know, it's a commodity card. But yet, in a you know, like thinking of other areas of investment, if you got something that doesn't go down in a significant down market, that that just stands out to me. So you know, it's a little off topic, but I I thought no, it was interesting to point interesting. out. No, and that's exactly why we like talking about these things is because they sometimes they tangent, and that's a really interesting point. So that's the instant takeaway I have already from this episode is that some of these cards that can survive a down market in a, in a high rate environment like mm -hmm. 2023, we're still looking at it in 2024, but I think there's some optimism that the Fed's not going to keep Jack in the Ray. They're gonna some, there's going to be some cuts coming. But ultimately, I think um, I wonder if what does that mean? For, what does that mean for the market, in your opinion? If you see this happen in 2023, if you're looking at 2024 from the market perspective, what does that tell you? The 89 Griffey holding the price? For just um, any cars, not just 89 Griffey, though. Cards like yeah. that? It's just It just has, me, has my curiosity peaked for any cards that survived 2023 and held strong. That tells me that... You know, it's e like speaking of Instagram, it's easy to get caught up in this Instagram world of, you know, maybe 500 people that's, you know, they're, that are the loudest. And it, mm -hmm. it reminds me that the collector base in sports cards is way bigger than that. And that most people coming in to collect want an 89 Griffey upper deck, right? Um, and so that just tells me that the demand is far outweighing the supply because in a market where even LeBron was down to 50% last year, that Griffey is, if anything, maybe even up slightly. And I'm seeing it with the 81 Montana PSA 9. I'm, I'm seeing it with these cards where I don't own an 81 Montana PSA 9. I don't know why. It's a card I actually love and have nostalgia for. You know, I should own 20 of those. Why, why do I not own them? And so it just has me thinking about, like, am I allowing myself to get caught up too much in this group think mentality on Instagram that I have to have only the most rare and scarce card when – why not buy a card I love in the investment side of me, the investment mind says, well, if it survived 2023 and didn't go down, obviously it's got a solid collector base. So, um, you know, those are things to think about for people on a budget that, you know, can look at some of these cards and say, Hey, 
I, I want a Griffey upper deck. Why, why don't I own one? This segues perfectly into my next question for you. You've been outspoken about the 90s market and questions yeah. about, is this really the place to be? Is it safe? If you don't like the word safe. So is this a, a space everybody's kind of running to, right? I mean, I'm one of them. I love those. I love cards and that. that I love the, the look of them. The Honestly, like a raise the roof, Fleur Mystique in 99, they establish or Fleur Brilliance, 24K cards. They're probably one of the most gorgeous cards I've ever seen created. So that's my thought. But So talk to me about your feelings about the 90s insert market. Well, I, I, not just 90s inserts, but 90s parallels is what I mostly focus on. So, you know, PMGs and credentials and star rubies and things like that. Um, I think we can learn a lot from them. So whereas I don't think they're a safe place and I think there is major air pockets in when I see a Mario Ellie sell for, you know, five to ten thousand dollars and I can buy a James Harden gold refractor rookie to 50 for that same price, I I think that there's a lot of risk there because it's it's back to that 500 people on Instagram thing. 500 people on Instagram are moving the market for 90s, right? And so as soon as I got back on Instagram, I was just overwhelmed by, you know, these Instagram accounts just showing me their 90s stuff over and over and over again. And if I'm not careful, I can almost think that that's like the reality of the whole market, right? Like I have to have these cards. Um, so I think there's significant risk in there. I think that, you know, some of these cards of players that, you know, shouldn't have much value or collectability like a Mario Ellie, like, you know, even a Rashid Wallace, like you're, you're seeing these kind of guys that I feel like, okay, we've gotten too far, but what I can learn from that is sets can be a Pareto, Pareto set, right? So the player doesn't have to be a Pareto player, but the set can. And what I've learned is, wow. So, why would I buy a Mario Ellie or an Eddie Jones when I can get a James Harden, when I can get a Kevin Durant, when I can get a Chris Paul and these two thousands cards have Pareto sets as rookies. Right. So it's a, it's a really interesting space that if you want to get ahead of nostalgia, there will be nostalgia. If, if there's nostalgia for Mario Ellie, you think there won't be nostalgia for Chris Paul and I can buy his rookie tops Chrome gold to 50 right now for Two thousand no, dollars, a third of Mario Ellie. So I, I just think that it's um, there's a lot of group thinking '90s. I think that guys that were in a lot earlier um, were very smart, like a Nat Turner, guys like that that were in way before that all the stuff spiked. Um, so I, I think there's an opportunity to learn from the '90s, learn from what's boomed in the '90s, and then you know move forward from that. Right, right. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, another question that yeah, that was uh, on my mind, speaking of like the things you're learning, mm -hmm. what are you collecting right now? Like, are you collecting, are you looking at those 2000 sets, those Pareto, potential Pareto sets or important yeah. sets? Are there players you're targeting? We talked about your, your blazer, um, appreciation from your youth and how Clyde Drexler and, and you know, the Duckworth and all those players that mean something to you. Are you still trying to acquire cards like that that means something to you that may not have the highest monetary value or are you targeting sets in the 2000s who are you what are you collecting and who are you collecting right now i i've been finding myself targeting sets in the 2000s especially rookie patch autos um gold refractor rookies um kind of going back to my true roots of being an 80s kid and i just love rookies and what i really like about these cards is for example you know i'll show you this uh, Kevin Durant rookie patch auto to 99, right? So this card peaked at $140,000, right? And wow. Kevin Durant is going to go down as one of the top players of all time. You know, we're not talking about Mario Ellie here or, you know, yeah. we're talking about one of the all time greats and I can buy his rookie card and a rookie patch auto with a beautiful auto on it, um, you know, for down 80, 90%. Um, another example I'll show you would be, you know, like cards like these where it's, um, you know, the rookie refra gold refractors of Dwayne Wade and James Harden. So, again, we're talking about all time greats and it's a Pareto set for those players and those players are all time greats. So these aren't, you know, two time all stars. These are if you look at James Harden, you can you know laugh all you want about he's not collectible. You know, he was runner up for MVP, then MVP and then runner up for MVP. So we're talking one of the all time greats. And 
these cards are down 80, 90% because they're not in that nostalgia curve yet. So I'm trying to kind of think about cards that people don't have nostalgia for, but I believe will have nostalgia for in the future and the Pareto sets. Both those sets are anchored by incredible, like the 09 Topps Chrome is the final year of Topps Chrome and it's anchored by Steph Curry. I believe the gold refractors in that set are going to be significant. The 03 Topps Chrome gold is obviously anchored by LeBron James. So not only are they great players and great sets, they're anchored by incredible players. And I think that's what it requires to be lasting, like a, a 90s Jordan PMG. You know, like those PMG sets were initially anchored by Jordan. That's what brought all the attention to them. Yeah, that's really, that's an interesting point. The curve, the nostalgia curve. Yeah. You know, I, I, you're, I understand you make you make great points about being anchored by certain players, great players, but the nostalgia curve hasn't caught up to some of those players yet. Some of them are still, obviously are still playing, mm -hmm. but we've already seen that happen with the 80s kids, our generation, the players, that's happened. Now yeah. that's kind of come, it's, it's gone like this and gone down, reset a bit. Now that next wave will be those players when those kid those people start running into more disposable income or able to you know get back into the hobby. Maybe they stay in the hobby, but they're not collecting as much. They're sort of hibernating, so to speak. Um, that could be the next big you know push is in that 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 nostalgia curve. That, that nostalgia curve to me is really fascinating thought. It's something I've never thought about. I mean, you think about it because you know that, okay, there's going to be another, there'll likely be another boom and the generational things happen. It just, mm -hmm. just, it's just, this is how it works, right? Well, if you um, think about psychology, what's really interesting is we, we don't recognize greatness when it's right in front of us. That's just how we are as people. We, you know, my, my, you know, teacher would tell me Jesus could knock on your door and you slam it in his face, right? It's like yeah. that whole idea of like, when it's right in front of you, you will not recognize it. And so you see people in the 90s, you know, buying guys that's like, man, I barely remember them. What were they like a two-time all-star? Or I could right. buy, you know, guys that were MVP and have championships, you know, now. But what's cool about the 2000s is their rookies have Pareto sets. So I don't have to reach for it. So an example of this would be Shaq and Michael Jordan are not nearly as collectible. Like, I mean, Shaq is not nearly as collectible as Jordan is what I mean. Right. Yeah, but a exactly. green PMG Shaq will sell for as much as a rookie Jordan PSA 10. Right. Yeah. So like the set actually overtakes the player in that case. Well, we have that now with 2000s where Carmelo Anthony may not be as collectible as Kobe Bryant, but I can buy his rookie patch auto out of 99. Right. For for pennies compared to Kobe Bryant. Mm -hmm. And so it's just one of those things where, you know, it's a combination of Pareto set, Pareto player, and analyzing and learning from the 90s. I'm just choosing to learn what I'm seeing from the 90s, and I'm not willing to take the risk on buying some of these players that I'm, I'm seeing on Instagram daily getting, you know, traded around over and over and over again. That's a good point. I think being careful about when you when you make a, a significant spend, you got to be really mindful of what yeah. you're spending that money on. I think I couldn't imagine – spending significant money on a prospect i mean real money the, the some of these quarterbacks you think about some of the the uh baseball the P bowman prospect. i mean i love bowman chrome prospect i'm a huge baseball guy but i mean who's holding the bag for wander franco right now i mean those cards right. are worth nothing right and what that, if you've spent considerable money on him yeah that brings me when you're talking about first bowman auto something that i was very wrong on is mike trout for example so I wasn't wrong on Mike Trout being the only player that really has an opportunity to be historic in this, this, this era. But what I was wrong on is learning about the first Bowman market and learning and just understanding how much those cards get hyped and how much they spike. So now looking back, I, I thought at one point, if I could get Mike Trout at 2018, 2019 pricing, that was good. Right. But now that I've continued to learn about the speculative nature of the first Bowman market, he was coming off of his third MVP at that time. That would be like Acuna winning two more and wanting to buy his first Bowman auto, right? Like just think about how much speculation and spikiness was in that. Um, so now when I look, I, now when I look back at historical pricing, I actually have to also now take in consideration, okay, what was going on in that time frame? How much, you know, was built into the pricing. 
you know, it was that a good time to buy. And so that's where I was completely wrong. So, you know, now what I've learned now is, you know, Mike, Tri Mike, Mike Trout in 2018, 2019 was a, an extremely high speculative bubble coming off of three MVPs. And so just going back to that pricing doesn't make them cheap. Um, so that, that was a big miss, but that's something I've learned. I've, you know, even looking at LeBron, I've been cautious on LeBron lately because I look at his 2019 pricing and I think about, well, how many more titles were built into that pricing then in 2018, 19? I'm sure it was probably more than one. I'm sure it was probably more than just that bubble title with the Lakers. So is LeBron at 2018, 19 pricing, is that a good deal? I, I don't know. I have to take into account people were probably still thinking he could catch Jordan at that time. I'm not sure. So it's, it's just an interesting to kind of learn and evolve and, um, you know, make mistakes and try to learn from them. That's interesting. So do you think LeBron right now, do you think his prices have settled enough or depreciated enough where he's a, someone that you can look at and go, you know, I don't think I'm overspending on him right now. Yeah, I think he's, I think he's come down a lot. Um, but my concern is when I talk to other collectors and I get comments like, Oh, I don't, I don't know about the Lakers this year. You know, I'm like the Lakers this year, I, I'm not buying LeBron cards because of the Lakers this year. And it reminds me of Brady a little bit. Like we've seen Brady cards come down after he's retired and it's almost yeah. like this, this speculative bubble kind of has to deflate slowly. Like the gamblers and the speculators and the non fans have to kind of come out of that market. And so what worries me is, is LeBron going to have his Jordan on the wizards moment, you know, where eventually people have to give up on him winning more titles. And eventually people have to say, okay, I'm buying his cards, not because I think he's going to win another title and where are the prices then? So that's, that's my, my hesitation with, investing significantly in LeBron is as long as he's playing and not winning titles, his cards will probably go down. That's just the way this market is. Um, you have to get everybody to finally give up on him. Like I'm saying with, you know, I'm sure if the card market were like how it is today, when Jordan was on the wizards, you would have seen that you'd have seen the complete giving up on Jordan. He would not have been cool to collect anymore. And that's when you'd want to buy him. Very, very cool. So anything on your mind as we uh, get close to wrapping things up here? We're trying to do quick hitters, 30 minutes. I know people like to have a little bit more time back. Uh, anything on your mind, anything that uh, you are thinking? Um, you know, I think it was a long time ago we just we, we talked about this whole Pareto thing, and now it's become part of the hobby vernacular. Is there? Yeah. Do you have another Pareto type, you know, epiphany that you're thinking that, that applies to the hobby that you could share with us today. I think we talked about it, the nostalgia curve. So when the greatness is right, in, when greatness is right in front of you, recognize it and understand that it's right in front of you. Like take like Chris Paul, for example, like 10, 20 years from now, there's a reason why they called him point God. Right. So just remember, like get ahead of the nostalgia curve. Get ahead of it. Get ahead of it. And look for those Pareto sets, the rookie card sets. Gold's That's always good. great, right? Golds are important. And when it comes to parallels, I do want to ask you that question. I just Now that I just brought that up, do you feel like gold prism, gold refractors? I, I mean, let's take it away from the, the, the important sets, too. Do you think in general, over time, those are going to be cards that will carry more demand? No, I would actually be concerned about non-rookie, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, tenth year gold refractors and their pricing. I, I'm i sticking to my roots, and that's a rookie. So I love when a guy has a rookie gold refractor, right, or a rookie patch yep. auto. Um, I would be concerned. Like, I, I see that there's a 2012 gold prism LeBron James up at auction right now, and it's already into the 120, 150,000 range. I would rather have his rookie tops chrome gold out, uh, rookie tops chrome gold to 50 because it's the rookie year, right? And there's 50. LeBron has what 11 years of prism golds. Um, so to me, I would be a little cautious when it comes to buying a guy's 10th year gold prism and paying 100 or 200K for it when you could get his rookie tops chrome gold to 50. Yeah, there's 50, but there's also 10 years of gold prisms. So I would be a little cautious when it comes to non rookie year. We are getting many years down the road in these guys' careers. All you know, you see it on Instagram again. It's that that 500 people on Instagram, you know, group mentality where everybody's making all these gold runs. Um, 
I would be a little concerned because at some point people are going to be done making these gold runs. And then who's the incremental buyer after that? No, very good point. Very good point. But you do have to remember 2012 Prism is probably, it's a pretty big set. I, I would argue that's a Pareto type set. There's less of them, of those golds. So there's, there's some of that demand and drive. It's there to make that more special, but you make a good point. Rookie car gold. Even if there's more of them, even if it's it is still 2003 tops, is still a pretty mm -hmm. big deal. It's a, that's a big set. So just these are interesting conversations, inter interesting thoughts. Brent, thanks for taking some time and, and doing a quick little 30 minute video with Melted Wax Podcast um, and join the Sports Car Dad Network once again. And you know we're happy to have you back, man. It's good to know you're still here, still in the hobby, still very very opinionated and and convicted on the things that you believe and see. Um, and honestly, it, it, some of it says carried some good truth to it. The Pareto stuff has been a really fun conversation and it's, it's kind of mapping out that way. And maybe we'll see in 2024, this nostalgia curve. Is there an opportunity to, to pick up some of these great players that are in that 2000s era that have some key significant cards and they're still playing to this day, but they're in the twilights of their careers. And that generation that grew up watching them are going to want those cards 10 some years from now. You know, when they the next boom hits the hobby and it'll look very different than this boom. Right. Because um, I think our hobby is going to be very mature by then. So I, I think it'll be a very different kind of um, boom, so to speak, if they're even if you even call it a boom. Would you do you anticipate something like that happening or do you feel like it's just going to be an organic, slow up scale sort of walk up to where that nostalgia curve hits again? Or do you think it's just going to be a nice stable and then all of a sudden, just like we saw a few years back? Yeah, I think that we'll, we'll see another cycle. We'll probably see a slow and steady. I think there's a lot less risk in these, and it's not a short-term thing. You know, buying a Kevin Durant rookie patch auto today, it's not like in six months I think that the, the prices is going to change significantly. I think it's going to be something that takes time, but I think it will grow over time. Interesting. Good stuff. Well, thanks, Brent, for joining us. If you want to comment below, yeah, comment below. Talk, Brent will talk to you. He will comment back. Uh, he will answer questions. If you if you disagree, he will happily engage. He has no problem doing that. And he enjoys it. I think it's all fun. And, and, and like we always say, and like Brent always says, right? There's no, you don't have to agree. There's that doesn't, that's not necessary. Agreement no, is not really, required. Yeah, agreement's not. Yeah. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk about it. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching. Enjoy your weekend. Um, click, subscribe, like, all the stuff. You can follow Brent at, at Deep Value Investor. Is there a one after it? Is, this, is it still the one? Just at Deep Value Investor on Instagram. You can find him on Twitter under the same handle. Thank you, folks, for joining us. Have a great day.